And he says, I seem to have slipped into the persona of a scientist turned activist, and I lecture a lot about GMOs. Dr. Thierry Vrain. Thank you. I'm still a scientist, but it, it, it seems in North America that if you are speaking against GMOs, against the, the, the technology, immediately you are labeled an activist. So that's the pun. <clears throat> I titled the presentation The Gene Revolution because it is a, gene, it is a revolution in agriculture. The uh, farmers love the technology. It uh, makes weed management uh, very cheap and very simple compared to what it used to be. And it uses a chemical a herbicide uh, that is uh, proclaimed to be completely innocuous. And tonight I'm going to show you some uh, evidence that it is not. You uh, basically, I could, I could subtitle the uh, uh, presentation A Tale of Two Molecules. You're all familiar with the DNA molecule, the double helix. And the little molecule with colors up above is the, it's, it's called glyphosate. It's the active ingredient in Roundup. Glyphosate, it's a very small molecule, it's made of glycine, it's an amino acid on the left side, there's a methyl uh, residue, and then it's phosphonic acid, it's a, basically glycine phosphonate, which has been shortened into glyphosate. And I think there is a, um, a movement, at least in North America, to <coughs> confuse people as to what genetic engineering is, at least in agriculture, what the gene revolution is about. The gene revolution is about selling Roundup. This is what it is. Everything else is a distraction. It's not about BT, it's not about papaya, it's not about golden rice, it's not about drought resistance, it's not about anything like that. It's about selling a herbicide. Evidently, the chemical industry is interested in doing that. So I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about Roundup and what it is and what it does, and then we'll go into what are GMOs, how they are created, and what they do and what they deliver. And I give this presentation normally in about an hour to an hour and a half. So obviously I'm going to, as, to have to zip through the slides pretty quickly tonight. I only have half an hour. So Roundup. Well, Roundup was uh, discovered, was created in 1964 by a small chemical company in the USA. Uh, as a chelating agent, it's a chelator. It grabs onto metal ions. Most of you know that proteins, which are enzymes, need a metal ion to work. Like you're probably familiar with hemoglobin. Hemoglobin in your blood needs iron. That's why you need iron in your, iron in your body. If you don't have enough iron, your hemoglobin does not work as well, and you're anemic. Well, it's the same thing for a lot of enzymes. And because Glyphosate was, is a chelator. It grabs onto many, it's a very powerful chelator, very broad spectrum chelator. It grabs onto many, many metal ions. It interferes with many, many enzymes. Yes, um, 1964 when, when it was created. 1970 is when the uh, patent, as it was discovered to be a very broad spectrum herbicide, it basically kills all plants. No wonder. And of course, uh, the firm Monsanto uh, bought the patent and started commercializing it as a herbicide. In 2010, it was patented as an antibiotic, as an anti elmantic to be precise, but it really means antibiotic. And so, genetic engineering in the early 90s. Uh, when the crops were created, basically the most of a 90 plus percent of all the engineered plants on the planet today are engineered to resist the herbicide Roundup. This is what the story really is. And Roundup ready crops have revolutionized agriculture again because they make man weed management very, very easy for the farmers. And of course, they've all adopted it 
90 plus percent of corn, soy, canola, cotton, all the major crops have been engineered and adopted by the farming community because it makes their lives easier and cheaper. It's, it's weed management is much cheaper. But Roundup has a serious problem because it is a chelating agent and because it interferes and impairs so many enzymes in basically most life forms. It does, it is toxic to fish. We've known for a long time, but it is teratogenic. It's very toxic to amphibians. It is toxic to bacteria in the guts of most animals. Most animals have bacteria in their guts, just like humans. And Roundup, because it is a chelating agent, as an antibiotic, impairs so many enzymes that it interferes with the, the guts in the bacteria of animals. Lots of studies have been done, lots of studies have been done in North America, in Europe, in the rest of the world, Japan, India, etc., Russia, and there's definitely a, a dichotomy between the results that we see coming out of North America and a little bit out of Europe and then most of the rest of the world. There's a huge discrepancy. In North America, and I would suspect because that's how it was when I was a scientist, that's where the money was for grants. Biotech money was, that's how I got into biotechnology because there was a lot of grant money to be had. And if you, why not uh, take advantage of that? But the rest of the world does not um, go by the results. When, when basically Monsanto, the chemical companies, the biotech, the chemical companies have morphed into the biotech companies. The chemical companies um, wanted to get in the market in Europe and other countries. Those countries said, not so fast. <clears throat> we need to test. And they did a lot of testing. And a lot of testing has been done. And a lot of results have been, have been shown. Now this, I'm going to show you, this is the effect of glyphosate on hepatic and intestinal activities in the rat. In bold, uh, in the bottom, is the uh, title of the uh, journal, the scientific journal that it's published in. Now this particular study found that glyphosate, the uh, active ingredient in Roundup, impairs, inhibits a whole family of enzymes that provide many essential services in the cells. If these enzymes are impaired, you get all kinds of symptoms. In mice and rats, this is what was seen. Gastrointestinal disorders. I'm not talking of tummy ache. I'm talking of Crohn's disease. I'm talking of celiac. I'm talking of leaky guts, that kind of gastrointestinal disease. Kidney and liver damage have been repeatedly shown. Infertility and cancer. There is a report, not a study, a report that was published last year out of... Uh, MIT, that because one of the authors was so uh, concerned with autism. Autism used to be a rare disease. One in 10,000 kids get autism until about 15, 20 years ago. Today it's one in 50. She was very, she is very concerned. And she looked into the possibility that if the cytochrome P450 family of enzymes would be inhibited, what would be the consequences in humans? Well, depression, autism, and Alzheimer were uh, obvious. Like I said, it's not a study, it's a, it's a report. So the industry is very quick, and you're going to hear that or read that many times repeatedly. The industry is uh, fond of saying, you know, trillions of meals have been served, millions of people have been eating GM food, and nobody has died, nobody has been harmed. This is a completely empty st statement. There is no follow-up, there is no knowing if there is any damage. The only um, signs that we have is what comes out of the hospitals. And what comes out of the hospitals are correlation curves. We can, we can see the number of people that have been hospitalized for kidney damage, for thyroid cancer, for liver damage, for, for depression, for autism, for all kinds of symptoms in the last 15 years since 
those crops have been engineered. 1996 was the first year. This is children diagnosed with celiac disease at Alberta's Children's Hospital, and the curve starts climbing up in 1995, 1996. This is uh, acute kidney injury plotted against glyphosate uh, use in uh, whatever, and again, the the, I could show you 20 of those curves. Again, these are correlation curves. There's no causation. There is no studies that have been done. Thank you. That's about Rwanda. What are GMOs? Well, GMOs are engineered to resist the herbicide. So they are called Roundup Ready. HT stands for herbicide tolerance. Roundup Ready crops basically, like I said, they simplify farming so much that the farmers obviously love it and adopted it uh, in, in droves. Uh, basically, you ignore the weeds. Imagine that you're a gardener or a farmer and you don't need to worry about the weeds anymore at all. You just ignore the weeds, you plant your seeds, and then you spray Roundup. And all your weeds disappear just like magic, and your crops and your vegetables are still standing. 90 plus percent of all engineered plants on the planet today are engineered to resist the herbicide Roundup. <clears throat> there is another category, a small category, much smaller, called BT. BT is a big, long, complex name. It's, it's the name of a, ba of a bacteria called Bacillus thuringiensis. And Bacillus thuringiensis produces a crystal protein, a protein that will kill insects. So the protein, the gene that codes for the protein is engineered into the plant. Every cell of the plant can now manufacture the protein. If the insect comes to eat the plant, they die. So it's a beautiful uh, technology, you don't need to spray insecticide anymore. The plant is the insecticide, and the plants are registered as insecticides. But really, it's a very small minority, as I said. HT, the Roundup Ready crops, are, are the, the big ones. How are they created? I normally take my time to, to explain that, but I don't have time tonight. The um, major technology is called a gene gun. It looks like a hair dryer and you basically shoot uh, micro, uh, microscopic pellets uh, coated with the gene construct that you want, the genes that you want, into the plant, and then you can regenerate a, a, new, a plant, an engineered plant, out of the cells that have, been, uh, that have received the gene into their nucleus, and hopefully the gene construct has been integrated into a chromosome of the plant, the gene gun. Another technology is the crown gall disease bacteria, Agrobacterium tumefaciens, you don't need to remember the name. It's basically the bacteria have a big chromosome, but they also have tiny, tiny circular chromosomes we call plasmids. And one of the plasmids of this bacteria has everything it needs to engineer the plant. These bacteria, it's very common, it's everywhere, maybe you see it on your raspberries or on thimbleberries, it's quite common. It's, it's a nor normal bacteria. It is the original uh, genetic engineer. So, knowing that it is an, a genetic engineer itself, we can study it, we can determine which plasmid is involved, we can uh, basically put in the gene that we want into the plasmid, and the bacteria transforms the plant. And then we get an engineered plant. And this technology is used for some of the plant, not very many, because the bacteria does not infect everything. When the plant cells have been uh, engineered, you just uh, regenerate a whole plant through tissue culture. It's complex, it's involved, but it's well, well known how to do that. So the most important part of my talk is what do they deliver? What does genetic engineering technology, particularly the uh, herbicide tolerant, the Roundup Ready crops deliver. The industry, the biotech industry, will uh, say uh, very repeatedly and very loud that they reduce their use of herbicide, they uh, increase yield, they are completely innocuous to the environment, and of course they are completely safe to eat. 
So I'm just going to look at GMOs reduce the use of pesticides. GMOs mean basically Roundup Ready crops. Reduce the use of pesticides. Well, if you ask me, that is a very strange uh, financial goal for a chemical company. And of course, that is not at all what happened. The sale of Roundup, because the technology has been so successful, the sale of Roundup has shot through the roof, but it's not just because it's been so successful, because the farmers can spray their crops repeatedly if need be. That's what they do. They, they want perfect weed control, and that's what they get, perfect weed control. And so the, this technology has increased the sale of the herbicide incredibly tremendously. And yes, 10 years ago, I would have said, I would have recognized that there was a slight uh, lower uh, sales of the insecticides because remember the BT crops which are supposed, which are the insecticide themselves you don't need to spray anymore so yes the sales of, herbic of uh, insecticides did go down but not anymore because the insects have become resistant to the technology and now the farmers have to spray the plants either to avoid the insects to become resistant or because the resistant insects are already in their fields. So there is no saving of pesticides in that manner. With the herbicide, it's even worse. You probably have heard the word super weeds. And what has happened in the last 10 years is that the weeds have become resistant to the herbicide because of overuse, basically. It's like you've heard the story about bacteria becoming resistant to antibiotic because we're using too many antibiotics too often. It's the same story. Biology will adapt, and that's what the plants have done. The plants have become re resistant. 40 species of weeds today are, I mean, I, it could be 41 or 42 as, as I speak, but 40 species or more of weeds resistant to Roundup are in Ontario, in Manitoba, in Saskatchewan, and in half of the USA. We do not have them in BC yet, as I as nothing has been reported, and there is no reason to believe that this will stay that way. They should be here this year, next year, or the next. There's absolutely no reason why we are not going to get uh, resistant weeds <coughs> in British Columbia or in the Comox Valley. So, today it's Roundup, but since the technology is failing, not everywhere, but almost, then, and since the company has known very well that this was going to happen, they have had many years to adapt and to create the next technology. And so now we have the next technology. We are going to spray 2,4-D. 2,4-D is completely different from Roundup. It's a hormone mimic. It's a hormone mimic, uh, uh, an auxin mimic in the plant. It is also quite toxic. It has its own history. Uh, it's toxic, uh, it causes Parkinson's disease. And the um, uh, farmers, the people who use 2,4-D are definitely very susceptible to Parkinson's disease. That's public, public knowledge. For those of you old enough to remember the Vietnam War, 2,4-D was Agent Orange. So, reduce the use of pesticides, maybe not. GMOs increase yield. There is absolutely no biological reason why uh, this technology should increase yield. Increasing yield is a very complex genetic uh, trait. You, you would need to mess with hundreds of genes to do that. It's not because you have a new gene or two that you're going to get increased yield. You might get increased yield if you get perfect weed control, yes. But actually what's uh, uh, shown is actually there is no increase in yield, period. This is a, uh, uh, an, uh, a curve showing the uh, yields in Europe over the last 15 years compared to the yields in North America over the last 15 years. And 15 years ago, the yields in Europe were lower than in North America. And today, the yields in Europe, this is for corn, the yields in Europe are higher than in North America. They do not use this technology in Europe. 
And there is a document that was put together a few years ago also with data from the USDA and other statistics that showed, and also some um, 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 studies that were done in Kansas State University, Iowa State University, and Illinois, that showed that there is a yield drag. If you use Roundup Ready crops, because of the genetic, um, um, because of the, the technology, the way the plants were engineered, there is, the plants are yielding less. And the studies that were done show, on average, 5 to 10 percent less. So when the growers tell me that, oh, they're getting so much more yield, I shake my head. <clears throat> no increase in yield. GMOs do not impact the environment. Well, there's definitely a question of gene flow because the engineered plants are releasing their pollen all over the place. If you are an organic farmer or a conventional farmer next to uh, people who are growing GMO corn or GMO soy or canola, etc., you cannot survive because you, your crop will be contaminated your grain, your seeds will be contaminated with, uh, with the, the, the genes from the engineered plants. So it's, it's contamination, basically. And so in canola, uh, I hear that it's basically very difficult now to, to, to find organic canola because of, of that problem. We lost our market for Europe, millions and millions of dollars lost because of contamination in Canada. Same thing with flax. A lot of people are very concerned about contamination in alfalfa because that is definitely will happen as soon as alfalfa is registered to be grown and it is being registered to be grown all over Canada. <coughs> alfalfa is the major food for cattle. Remember what I said about Roundup? 90 plus percent of all engineered plants are sprayed with Roundup. The residues of Roundup, the antibiotic Roundup, are in the engineered plants and in the food. But there is a much more serious problem called genetic pollution. And genetic pollution is basically gene flow, but this time it's to the bacteria in your guts the bacterial transgenes that are in the plants, that were engineered in the plants, can move, and this has been shown, this is published, can move from the transgenic crops to the soil bacteria and to humans. Human volunteers that were fed a meal of soybean, engineered soybean, the DNA of the soybean was not completely digested, and there was evidence of lateral gene transfer to gut bacteria. Meaning, meaning the genes that were engineered into the plant will find their way into the bacteria in our guts. And this could be very dangerous. And the reason is that with the genetic construct that is engineered into the plant, when you do the experiments, when you do the engineering, you need to find the plants that have been, the cells that have been engineered it's a very, very low uh, success uh, rate of kind of experiment. So maybe one in a million cells have been, has been engineered when you shot the plant. You need to find that cell. And the way that has been, the way to do that, and it's not the way it's done anymore, but all the engineered crops today have been done this way. The way to do that is to add a antibiotic resistance gene with what you're shooting into the plant. That antibiotic resistance gene comes from a bacteria. It's in every cell of the plant. And now what I'm talking about is that it will find its way into the bacteria in your gut. A series of experiments was done in China. They sampled rivers in China looking for bacteria uh, with antibiotic resistance. They found antibiotic resistant bacteria in every river they sampled. And the gene for antibiotic resistance in those bacteria was a synthetic gene. It came from a lab. And probably, it's not proven yet, probably it came from the engineered crops that were in the region. So no impact on the environment. 
and of course they are very safe to eat. When the uh, genetically engineered crops were uh, ready for commercialization in 1996, there was a concept called substantial equivalent that was put forward by whoever, the industry or even the regulatory agencies, I do not know, but it's called substantial equivalence. And what that means is that basically it's like grass. It's like, you know, you know the concept of generally recognized as safe for chemicals, grass. It's, it's basically the same thing. And so this is like recognized as safe. The plant, it's corn. It looks like corn. It tastes like corn. It behaves like corn. It's the same. Yes, of course, it, it, it has been engineered and it contains a new protein, but that protein has been shown to be safe. And so therefore, substantial equivalence, which means that the plants were never tested by the regulatory agencies in the USA or in Canada. And yes, some people, the industry, will argue, will let me know very loudly, that there are hundreds, thousands of studies that have been done showing that these crops are very safe. I call it corporate science. I think we here in, in North America, we live in a bubble. We live in a biotech bubble, and the rest of the world is not in that biotech bubble. Like I, I think I said it in a, uh, when I started, most countries in the world do not go by these studies. They've done their own research, and they have said no. <clears throat> so I'm just going to quickly show you. Um, the plants, this is from uh, uh, Belgium, the plants that have been engineered contain new proteins. Proteins that were not predicted. Proteins that are unstable. And to understand how that happens, you just have to imagine that the genome of a plant, the genome of an animal, of a whatever, a genome, is a very complex ecosystem. And that we did not know until 2002 when we finished, uh, when we completed the human genome project, the study of the genome. We sequenced the whole genome of a human being in 2002. Discovered that we function with 100,000 proteins, but we only have 20,000 genes. How could that be? Well, it can be because the genes talk to each other, the genes regulate each other, the genes play with each other, and there's a lot of regulatory sequencers in the genome and there's a lot of feedback loops and we don't have a clue as to how it works. So when you blast something into the genome, you get collateral damage. And you get new proteins made, and this is completely denied by the regulatory agencies and the industry, but there's lots of studies that show that there's lots of new proteins, truncated proteins, and we don't know what they can do. Journal of Protein Research, 43 proteins in engineered corn plants were significantly disrupted compared to non-engineered plants. In 1996, the toxicologists, the Food and Drug Administration in the USA has a whole body of research scientists and their job is to test the new products new chemicals, new whatever, that are proposed by the industry before they can be registered and commercialized. Those toxicologists basically all agreed to each other, with each other, that those new engineered crops could be dangerous, they would produce new proteins, and these proteins could be toxic or cause allergies or cause nutrient deficiencies and a whole host of other problems. This is 1996. The director of the FDA, of the Food and Drug Administration at the time, who after he, well, the director of the FDA basically ignored his staff and decided to register those crops. He had worked for Monsanto before and he became soon after that a vice president of Monsanto. Scandinavian Journal of Immunology, the BT proteins, oh, allergies. This is about allergies. This is documented, this is published. Immune response to BT protein, again, published. BT corn causes anaphylactic shock, allergies. Leukemia. And then there is a, another whole body of research, of studies, published studies, showing that 
mice, rats, fed engineered grain, soy or corn have damaged organs. Liver, kidneys, testicles, uterus, ovaries, infertility, the list is very long. This is mostly out of Europe and Japan and India and Russia and a few other countries. I'm going to finish with two studies which are completely denied by the biotech industry and the regulatory agencies. This is the first alarm bell. This is 1998. This is two years after the crops were commercialized in the USA. The European Union decided that no, they were not going to accept those crops without doing any testing. They asked one of their prominent toxicologists to put together a protocol of research to, show, to, to study if those crops were safe. And that's what he did. He uh, studied engineered potatoes and he showed after a few, feeding the, the rats a few, for a few months and of course uh, did autopsies and he was completely surprised. He was not expecting that much. He was very surprised to show damage to many organs. This is the lining of the, stom of the uh, stomach of the rats. <coughs> and um, the story goes that basically he went on TV. He was so alarmed by, the, by his uh, results that he decided to go to uh, television to warn the people, to warn the public that this actually was dangerous and he was fired the next day. There was definitely some political uh, interference. He was fired. This is a prominent toxicologist hired by the European Union to do this protocol of research. He was fired and gagged the next day. His lab was closed, his papers were confiscated, and then things, there was a big reaction from the scientific community. That was a very big scandal. And a year later, he was given his papers back and he published in one of the probably the most prestigious medical journal in the world, The Lancet. And I'm going to finish with another study which is from last year. This is out of France. And again, this study is, is the biotech industry which went crazy with it. <coughs> when Monsanto wanted to uh, commercialize their crops uh, in France, the French government asked for them to do a study. And they did a study for, they fed rats and mice for several months. They reported their, their results for three, the first three months, showing that nothing happened. There was no symptoms. Everything was cool. And one of the scientists in France looked, uh, uh, asked for the data that was refused. He went to court and finally obtained the data, the numbers. Uh, research uh, from Monsanto and reanalyzed statistically and found that there were indeed differences after three months of feeding the rats. But the differences were not huge and the industry says, oh, this is not biologically relevant. And you know, when you do a, a, a research study and you find significant differences, that's what statistics are for, there are definitely a relevance. But that was ignored. So he decided to repeat the experiment. And this professor repeated the experiment done with Mons by Monsanto with exactly the same strain of rats, exactly the same protocol, except instead of doing it for three months, he decided to do it for two years, which is the whole length of the life of a rat. And what he found was that after four months, there were significantly different differences in the kidney and liver damage, organs. There were other organs damaged, but also he found a lot of cancer. I said earlier that the biotech, when that was published, the biotech industry went crazy because he had the cancer tumor, breast cancer, the, the cancer tumor were bigger than the, the heads of the rats and, and all kinds of objections, all kinds of critics flew around this was completely invalid. This, should, this study should be retracted. Shame on you. Shame on everybody who published this, etc., etc. He has responded to every critic. One of them was like, you used this, the wrong strain of rat. He used exactly the same strain of rat that Monsanto study did. 
He has responded to all the critics. I've looked at the arguments. I've looked at his responses. And to me, they make perfect sense. I'm asked often, like, what can we do? Well, there is not a lot you can do other than educate yourself. Um, obviously, there's a lot of information on the Internet. There's a lot of information available that will tell you that there is absolutely no risk. There's no danger. There is no, no reason to be afraid of anything. Everything is safe. Me, I would tell you, since 90% of corn, 90% of corn, of uh, canola, uh, sugar beet, 100% of sugar beet, all the sugar in the store is engineered. Um, cotton seed oil, what else? Did I Soybean, all those in the stores contain residues of Roundup, the antibiotic Roundup. Plus, the new proteins that are probably in some of the corn and soy. So avoid industrial prepared food, baked good, processed junk food, canned, all that is contaminated with engineered ingredients. If you so choose, organic is still your best bet. Definitely there is a level of contamination of organic food with engineered food, but at least it's a lot less than the normal food. And the natural, by the way, the natural uh, label in the store me is completely meaningless. It's basically a, uh, it basically means it's, uh, it's engineered. Make your voice heard. Talk to your friends, talk to your neighbors, your family, talk to your elected leaders, your municipal council, talk to your MP, your MLA. I'm on my way to Ottawa. That's why I'm, that's why I'm doing this. I'm going across Canada. I, I hope to have, um, for a month, it's going to be very intense, all over BC and Alberta, and then it will be, after uh, New Year's, it will be the rest of Canada. I intend to finish in the office of the Minister of Health and discuss this.